So uh, a big topic, you know, going around the Idaho 4 case right now in the true crime community, just something people keep bringing up that I see being brought up is Ann Taylor going to defend Brian Koberger well. Like, is she going to do a good job doing it? Is she, is she going to... Does she have a conflict of interest, okay? Uh, people worry about her integrity right people now. People are questioning is... her integrity, yes. And that is exactly what I'm trying to say. People are questioning her integrity um, if she's in it for the long haul, if she's in it to actually, you know, defend her client and and get him found not guilty because a lot of people believe that he's really innocent or could be. Um, and they want to make sure he has a f fair trial, and I understand that. Uh, I get that, but... I don't find any basis for the claims that Ann Taylor's integrity is to be questioned. I, I find no basis for that personally, but we're going to do a Ann Taylor deep dive. And I want to know what your guys' thoughts are, you know, at the end of this, please leave it in the comments. What you think is her integrity up for debate? Is it a question? Um, do you think that she's going to defend him with integrity or is there some conflict of interest here? Um, so, there is not a lot of information on Ann Taylor just based off Google searches. There's not. There's not a lot. Um, but we have some things here that are relevant, important. We have a little bit of background on her. So one important thing to mention is that Ann Taylor is not a, a public defender in Lataw County. She is from Kootenay County. Um, so there are only four public defenders in Lataw County. That's it. And two of them recuse themselves from this case. Okay. And we need a public defender who is death penalty certified. We need one who is qualified for a case of this magnitude. So they had to go to Kootenay County. And if they couldn't find somebody there, they were going to have to go all the way to like Boise, a major city super far away that they would have had to pay a ton of money out of pocket for. Like, you got to remember that. If they couldn't find someone in Kootenay County, they are going to have to go way outside of it, and that would have costed the state a ton of money. Yeah. So Ann Taylor pretty much was the only choice in the situation. Now, two, one per, two people I want to refer to is Andrea Burkhart did a three-part series on Ann Taylor's conflict of interest. The lawyer you know, I saw two videos from him on this topic, and they were specifically surrounding the issue with Kara. The fact that her or her office defended Kara for several times, actually, sure. um, in the past. And right when Brian Koberger was indicted... Ann Taylor signed a document uh, removing her from Kara's cases, yep. the current case that she was defending her on. Um, now, I've heard people saying it was only her office, but from the documents I saw, it looked like her. So I don't know what the truth is because, and I'll have a picture up of the document, it shows her. Specifically, Are you sure it's not showing her office. It doesn't say her office. It's signed Ann Taylor, and it says Ann Taylor in the document. It does not say this office. So I don't know for sure. There could be other documentation that I am missing. And if you guys know of any, please let us know if it shows like it was her office and there was a different attorney. But in the documentation that the lawyer you know and Andrea Burkhart both showed, it showed her recusing herself from Kara's case and offering another public defender by name. Okay. So it seems pretty definitive to me. Um, now, does that mean Kara ever even met Ann Taylor? Well, with her covering her cases numerous times in the past, According to the Crime Sleuth interview that Kara did recently, you said, you watched that specific part where she talks about how she never actually met her. Yep. That there was some kind of mix-up with Signature or whatever, and she wasn't actually the one who oversaw her case. Okay. So, see, that's where this gets confusing, because that document and, and Kara's account 
it doesn't quite make sense. Yeah. Um, there, I'm sure there could be more documents out there that we just don't have our hands on that maybe nobody has requested, um, for us to know for sure. Mm -hmm. But, but if Kara says she never met her, I mean, that matters, but also in Kara's interview with Banfield, which was earlier this year, she, um, talks about how she's like, feels personally betrayed that she trusted Ann Taylor. And that made it sound like she had met her. Yeah. Yeah. You had mentioned that. It's, it's a little weird. Maybe we can play a clip of those two situations, like very short clips, because it seems contradictory. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm more inclined to believe the later interview with Carm Sleuth in for some reason, but that's just me. Yeah. You guys decide what you believe on that. But regardless of that, According to Andrea Burkhart and the lawyer you know, and many other experts I've watched on this, regardless of her even have been a literally cares public defender, there's still no proven conflict of interest. Yeah. Unless it could be proven that Kara was going to be on the witness stand and Ann Taylor herself would have to question her uh -huh. and use her own personal knowledge of Kara possibly to question her in sure. the court. Sure, sure, it, that Which there's no saying that would have ever happened. Yeah. Uh, there's no com direct conflict of interest, no reason that she couldn't represent Brian yeah. Koberger um, at all. Well, also, even in that situation, like, the prosecution would have to have an issue with that on top of it. And, and the they judge, would have to bring it up and, yeah. There was a hearing, and the judge did declare that she did not have a conflict of interest. Okay. This was addressed Whoa. by the court, okay? Well, and that's they, awesome. They declared there was no conflict of interest. Great. And declared... De uh, recused herself immediately when she found out she was representing Brian Koberger. Well, and that is up to the lawyer themselves. They are, they're supposed to make that call when mm -hmm. they feel like there could even be a potential conflict of interest. It's their call, whether they want to continue representing both clients or not. And she chose the safe route. So I think she did the right thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all I've seen is trustworthy, uh, work from from Anne so far. I really I know there's this underground like bickering about whether they trust Anne or not. But dude, that is like I feel so weird about that because we haven't seen any behaviors that should cause that, and that's my big issue. Is like we're judged on how we act and how we treat people. Not how it looks. We look. Things look. Yeah, and we'll, we'll get into some of the running narratives, but... So I wanted to mention that because that was kind of more of the conversation of the past, like about eight to nine months ago, people were questioning that. And I wanted to address that real quick to just get it out of the way. Yeah. Because what's being questioned now is not that, really. Um, but we had never talked about that before, so I wanted to get it out of the way. So who is Ann Taylor? Well, um, she is born in 1965, 57 years old. She's a lawyer who's currently working as chief of Kootenai County Public Defender's Office. She's been practicing since the 90s. Um, she wasn't like, she was really well known to the area but not the nation, obviously, until Koberger's case. Mm. Um, she did have a LinkedIn, but apparently made it private. Um, I've been trying to get my hands on to see if there's like an internet archive of it. Mm -hmm. um, haven't been able to yet, but I'm still working on it. And if I find the information, we'll have to talk about it on live stream yeah. or a follow-up video. Um, so... She started representing Brian Koberger January 5th. Um, and she apparently recused herself literally like the day before or day of that. So it's, it's as soon as she found out about that. Hmm. Now we have from 2017, um, when she was announced to be hired as the new Kootenai County public defender, um, the chief in 2017, that's when they did this little thing on her, kind of citing her background. And so far, this is the most credible information I've been able to find on her background. Hmm. Um, now, I know that she 
became the chief in 2017, but worked for the public defender's office in Kootenai County from 2004 to 2012. Um, she w- apparently she first went to Idaho State University, where she got her bachelor's degree in political science and master's degree in public administration. And then she went to University of Idaho and graduated there with her master's in 1998. Okay. So since then... You mean doctorate. Oh, yeah, doctorate. Doctorate, yep, my bad. She got yeah. her bachelor's and master's from Idaho. Yes, bachelor's and master's from Idaho State University. Yep. And then University of Idaho is when she got her doctorate, doctorate yep. in 1998. Right, that's when she graduated. So since then, she's been practicing law on the local, federal, and state levels. She's worked all three, which is pretty impressive. And she even had a private practice at one point, but apparently, or worked for a private practice. I can't find the exact, like, I just know that she was private at some point. Okay. And I don't know what that means exactly, because... From 1998 to 2004, like when she started working for the public defender's office in 2004, that whole time is blank. I don't know what she was doing. Like if she was interning for a private practice, maybe that's what it was. Hmm. Maybe she came onto a private practice and kind of worked for them and then decided to go to the public defender's office. Was she, do you know if she already was a bard uh, while she was working on her doctorate? No, I don't know that. Because you There's don't need a doctor to to get a bar to be barred. Right. So. Yeah. That's true. I, I I I bet she was. Yeah. I bet she I was. I wonder. So she might have been working then and her doctorate was kind of like a slow process maybe. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. So She's held previous positions with Kootenai County, and this is in 2017 when they're announcing her as the chief. It said that she worked previous positions, which we know from 2004 to 2012, um, including five years in the prosecutor's office and eight years as a deputy public defender. Mm. In addition, she has more than five years experience, private practice experience in criminal defense, and is on the board of the Idaho... Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers and is death penalty certified. Uh, Now, we have some quotes from her, and these quotes, like, they make her seem like she's really bought into being a public defender. Like, it matters to her. Dude, public defenders don't make that much, you guys. No. When you're looking at their salary, they're making, like, between one fifty and 200000 which for a doctor-level lawyer... Is not that much. Agreed. So her this quote says, As I begin this journey, I'm excited to do my very best. I'm so excited to lead the Kootenai County Public Defender's Office. And most of all, I have gratitude for all the members of the Public Defender's Office. I am grateful to be welcomed by an outstanding office, and I'm looking forward to us standing together to advocate for citizens in Kootenai County. Um, Chairman Mark Eberlin... Eberlin, Lean, maybe, added, We are very excited to have Anne return to Kootenai County as one of our public, as our new public defender. She is well respected in the community and brings a wealth of knowledge and experience to this position. We have every confidence that she and her staff will continue the tradition of providing excellent level of service to the community and their clients. Um, so, I mean, it sounds outstanding. Like, I also have another article here um, where there's even more quotes. So this is uh, the Coeur d'Alene Press, or it's Coeur d'Alene slash Post Falls Press. And this is also from 2017 when she became the chief. Um, so it this quote says, I always thought that was the job I'd want someday. Taylor, who specialized in criminal defense and private practice for the firm of Palmer, George, and Taylor. There, I found the private practice. I didn't even notice Robert, that Robert, George, and Taylor? So, so she was a name. in criminal defense and private practice for the firm of Palmer, George, and Taylor. She was a named 
member. Wow, that's super uncommon. Well, see, I hear that running narrative. So she was with them for five years. So, yeah, she went from private to public defender. Usually it's the opposite. Yeah. 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 So that that tells me personally. But her name was on that. That's right. uncommon for for lawyers' offices. Normally, you have to work to that. Oh yeah, to be a named partner named is what partner. they call yep. it. Named yeah, named partner. That's it. Yep. You do just like the Johnny Depp uh, and and uh, Amber Heard case. Yep. The the girl who represented Amber Heard or Johnny Depp the most, she got named partner for that trial. Oh. She made named partner because of it. Yeah. For outstanding work. Yeah. You, so it takes... It looks good for the it office. It depends on the office, but you work hard, you can become a named partner like that. Yep. So for her to go from a named partner at a private law firm to public defender tells me that she cares about this work a lot. Yeah, you're and talking she was name a prosecutor. Partner? Dude, name partners can make what the annual salary is in uh as a public defender in a quarter it's Literally way more a money quarter. and she was a prosecutor at one point which i heard bob mata say this at one point that he never sees defense lawyers becoming prosecutors it's always prosecutors becoming defense lawyers yeah they probably see the problems and they're like i don't i don't want to do this anymore this is why i don't like you know, Nancy Grace talking crap on Ann Taylor, saying, I don't know how you can look yourself in the mirror, defending Brian Cober. It's because they're defending people's rights. They're not just defending murderers, like, and trying to get them off. You know what I mean? They're defending rights. Everyone's rights to make sure everybody has a fair trial so that when that person is innocent, they're not railroaded. Or guilty. Or guilty or to make sure guilty. it's a fair trial so they can't get out of it. Yep, can appeal it and, and get a retrial or get a mistrial because something came up, like the that widow dude that killed multiple of his wives. you got to make sure now, it's the right person. Agreed, agreed. It's important. Defense attorneys are there to defend our rights. So it sounds like this is what happened. From 2004 to 2012, which, again, I don't know what happened between 1998 and 2004. Maybe that's when she was in the prosecutor's office. That would make sense to me. So maybe from graduation, I'm just trying to connect dots here with the years we've been given. Prosecutor's office from the time she graduates to 2004, she works for the public defender's office. And then it says that she worked Okay, so from 2012, now I know this for sure, 2012, 2017 is her private practice. Okay. And then, so it went, I'm assuming, with the, with the prosecutor's office, it was before 2004. But I know for sure, 2004, 2012, public defender, okay? And then 2012 to 2017, she was in private practice. And then 2017 is when she came back to the public defender's office as a chief, as okay. head of it, and has been there since. Okay. Yep. So she says it's such necessary work, um, referring to what interested her in the public defender position. It's important to make sure constitutional rights apply to everybody. You help people who are facing horrible times. I love the work. Uh, She took the position for John Adams, who retired in March after nearly 21 years as the chief public defender. Um, It says that she was an Idaho native, graduated Idaho State University, where she earned a bachelor's degree, a master's degree. She earned her doctorate from University of Idaho. So that's confirmed here, too, in 1998. Interesting, right? Because I, I it kept is seeing interesting. I kept seeing people say, "Well, she graduated from University of Idaho. Uh, was she a part of a fraternity or a sorority? Is there a conflict of interest there? Um, because you know these students were going to the same university as her. I don't know. 
Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that. I, I go back to the fact that why why are we judging, grading, holding somebody accountable to how something looks, yeah. not their actions? And I don't know. It, it To me, it's just a very simple thing. You you ha- you got to give people a chance. I'm not saying trust people, but allow people the space to to act how they want and then base your judgments off how somebody acts. You know what I mean? I think she has been trying hard. I think she has been working hard. I think she's and, been working her butt off, man. Yeah. And there's been multiple times in the courtroom where neither of them have been happy, meaning she's obviously making progress somehow in some way in some places. You know, we've seen them butt heads like over the IGG stuff just recently in the Zoom hearing. They were butting heads. Yeah. Now, here's the things that people want to cite is, OK, Steve Gonzalez said supposedly that he feels like the the judge, the defense and the prosecution are all on the same side sometimes or the defense and the prosecution at the very least are on the same side a lot of the times. And that clearly bothered him. I see people making that argument now, too, that like, well, they both signed off on the house getting torn down. And they see that as red flags. Um, what's some of the other stuff? It was, um, oh, the gag order, the no cameras. So we have house getting torn down, gag order, no cameras. Yeah, but dude. It... They feel like those things being on the same page are a problem. She, she, she needs to do what's best for Brian, not what's best for us. And if she's in a situation where she feels like there should, there could be some major, major questions around this investigation, which in my opinion, it sure seems like that's what she's going after in, in when asking for this certain discovery in this certain way and the police officer's background and, and training and things like that, then she probably knows she's more likely to have succeed and or success in this by taking cameras out. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. I I understand why taking cameras... When she sees all this character assassination, it makes sense for her to want cameras out. It makes sense for, for her to want a gag order so that this evidence yeah. can't be keep being misinterpreted by ma- mainstream media. I agree. And, and use two character assassinate him. I agree. The house getting torn down, she got 3D scans of it. She was out there right after, and I have pictures here from the Daily Mail of her out there like right away. At the house. And they were doing scans. They were taking pictures. They were investigating. So maybe she felt they had all they needed from the home. You know what I mean? Like there's... I don't know. I just... I don't know if I can see it. I don't know if I can see it. Her being on the same page as the prosecution and dealing with him to get Brian convicted intentionally. Um, So here's, here's one case. Taylor worked on the case of Jonathan Ellington who was accused of using his car to run over a woman in a road rage incident. Uh, He was 45 at the time, was convicted and sentenced to 25 years for the crime before having it overturned because of an Idaho police officer's false testimony. So Taylor said that Rice was pivotal in the verdict against Ellington, which was the police officer, adding that he had a presence in the courtroom. Fred Rice, the police officer, was accused of lying in the court in relation to the incident. Um, He was later... So she gets it called out. She gets this case overturned. And then there's another trial. And he was later reconvicted of the charges during a second trial after the Supreme Court ruled that Rice lied on the stand. What? He was still convicted? Yeah, that's what it After sounds like. After the police officer lied? Yeah. But she called it out and got it overturned. Yeah. Yeah. So, I don't know. It's She's odd. not afraid to call out She's not corruption. afraid to call it out. No. Yeah. yeah. So, there were false statements from Idaho police. She got it overturned. Um... But yeah, it sounds like he was later reconvicted. 
I mean, maybe he was really guilty, though. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. So. I, I, I get it. So, I, I mean, regardless of whether he was innocent or guilty, she still found that a police officer had lied to get the conviction, and that's still wrong. Like, police officers should obviously not be doing that because what if he wasn't reconvicted the second time? What if that's found in Koberger's case and he's innocent? You know what I mean? But yeah. he gets convicted because police officers are up there lying. Yeah. Or what if that guy Dr. was Moore. really guilty and it got overturned and he didn't get reconvicted and now we got a killer on the streets? Like, when you are a public official, you're law enforcement, you're an investigator, you are a prosecutor, anything like that, and you're involved in this process, you lying jeopardizes the entire case. Everything. You're in literally every putting way. it all on the table. Yeah, whether he's guilty or innocent, it makes no sense. Well, and That's I what think we've been saying the whole time. And it's right for her to call that out and for him to have her trial and reconvicted <laughs> if he's truly guilty because nobody knows if he's truly guilty if you have officers lying on the stand. Agreed. I agree. Then you I have agree. to put all the evidence up for question. Like, are they lying about everything? Is he actually guilty? If you find one lie, there's usually more. Yep. Absolutely. So, I mean, we know that she's uncovered corruption in the past, okay? Um, and as far as I've heard, this isn't the only case. It's just the only one I have pulled up right now for the sake of time. Um <laughs> We can always do a part two, or I can pull it up more in a live stream. You know, we can yeah. premiere this and do a live stream after yeah. or something and talk about more. Um, but my point is, is I have found nothing to prove any kind of issues regarding her um, that I would make me feel that she's not in it. No, to, I to support her client and get him the fairest trial possible and maybe even prove his innocence, which is not her job. She shouldn't be proving his innocence. No. That's not her job. No. It's to cause reasonable doubt. It's to uphold his rights. Um, it's the prosecution that has to prove he's guilty. Correct. Correct. Yep. But I Absolutely. Despite and I think it's commendable, and I think it is... Uh, a super important thing to look at the amount of pay they're getting. Like I said, uh, def defense attorneys are there for the people and they are clearly bought in to do this work. I'm, I just think it's silly. Like, okay, let, let's track this real quick, right? I know we're kind of at the end of the story time here, but let's track this real quick. So what are people saying? They're saying that she worked at the prosecutor's office and then just like made some kind of under the table agreement. Like, Hey Bill, uh, I, I think one way we could get a leg up into taking people down who we want to take down is I'll go work at the, uh, defense I'll go work at the defense table, but really I'm working for you guys and with you guys. And you know what I mean? That doesn't make sense. Neither She's, of them make good money. N no, it, it makes no sense. There's it, no financial gain. People keep compar comparing it for Delph to Delphi. These two cases are not comparable, okay? No. The judge is not literally violating the client's rights. Yeah. Okay? Anne has been calling things out from the beginning. She absolutely has yep. been. It, it just hasn't been met with the same illegal behavior that Judge Gull is doing yeah. in Delphi. Um, I agree. I, I don't feel they're comparable. You don't have this authoritarian judge coming in and, and being like, you are grossly neg negligent lawyer yeah. in removing things from the docket right. and, and doing illegal stuff, like I said. I mean, if that were happening, I guarantee you Ann Taylor would be fighting as hard as those lawyers. I do believe those lawyers... Uh, believe that Richard Allen is innocent possibly everyone keeps saying that is this is what it looks like when these you know lawyers believe he's innocent maybe not maybe it's just this is what it looks like when they know somebody's rights are being violated yeah um and and that what's happening is not right regardless of innocence or guilt right um because like we said this sets a precedence for future cases and you know I 
I don't know if Ann Taylor thinks he's innocent or not. That's not what defense lawyers focus on. Usually yeah. they focus on the evidence and seeing, is this a case we can win or we're going to lose? Um, if they feel like it's one, they're going to lose. A lot of times they try to make a deal, yeah. which she has not tried to do no. whatsoever. And neither is a prosecution. Maybe that's because she knows the prosecution won't even offer a deal. Um, Maybe that's why. But so far, she's been picking apart every bit of their evidence. Yeah. And, you know, I saw uh, Cluminati point out the other day, which is a video I hadn't watched before, um, that in his alibi, she literally fed them their own PCA. As, like, the reverse. Which is super smart. I never thought of it that way. When she wrote out his whole alibi, she literally, like, repeated point by point their own PCA and fed it back to them. Yeah. It's kind of funny. That is. But, I mean, I, obviously everyone's entitled to their own opinions. My, It's just not my personal opinion that she is, like, this walking double agent yeah. for the prosecution. No, I agree. And has this bias because she went to the same university as the victims. Um, you know, I, I'd be curious to understand her more. But this, we just have her law background. And honestly, that's even fragmented. I had to connect those dots here with you guys yeah. um, to really make sense of it. So, I don't know. Yeah. I think it's interesting. I think it's unfair uh, that you have somebody that is a defender of our public rights that by all accounts looks like uh, she's doing some really good work, really important work, and work that matters to her and everything that I've seen her do has been really commendable. And I don't know, it's kind of messed up to just yeah. be like, to jump down that rabbit hole, man. Well, it's true that not all public defenders are as dedicated as... As what I see she well, appears to be. Sure. There are some that are extremely overworked. Almost all of them are extremely overworked. Yeah. All of them. But there are some that are those public defenders that are just like, let's get you the easiest plea. Let's get you the easiest plea. Let's get you the easiest plea. And they just cycle these clients in and out. And they don't care. Um, you know, yeah. I've dealt with one before. You know, yeah. a couple actually in my past. Uh, where it is that? You yeah, walk in, they get sure. you the best deal, you walk out, or you go to jail, like, yep. you know, for sure. and they don't care what happens to you. They're not that invested in you. They're just worried about the next client that's coming up. Um, that's yeah, true. That's sure. true. But by all accounts, Ann Taylor doesn't seem to be one of those. And it seems like she's high enough up there that she really only handles the major cases that, like, she is required for. Yeah. The bigger ones. But... You know, let us know what you think. 